We've got everybody checked in and ready to roll. Go ahead, you're open to vote. Three. Put it over the slate now. Two, one. Take camera one. Go, John. Welcome to Washington Post Live. That was uh, quite an intro. My gosh, we should probably just leave it right there. I've hit the big time, Washington Post. I can like go home and tell my parents what I did today. Between Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Washington Post Live itself, we are now reaching hundreds of thousands of homes across all 50 states. The power of this platform is it takes people into the world of ideas. Audience members of Washington Post Live are part of the conversation. Audience or viewer question from George Kralovic from Virginia asks, now that we have the Inflation Reduction Act, do we still need a price on carbon? Whether it's with cancer scientists or politicians. You know, this panel, I think, was originally called, you know, two women against Putin. It really should be three women against Putin. <laughs> and so The better way to get things done, as I've demonstrated, is by putting a group together and negotiating something that's good for both uh, points of view. I think Washington Post Live has given us as a newspaper a, a new platform, a common meeting ground. When they're sitting in their own space, there is a sense of, of ownership and comfort. It's great that you guys have you know, expanded into these formats to give people a, you know, a greater ability to have a, a longer conversation. So I look forward to talking to you today. And their individuality comes through more so than just their title. Thank you for being the agents and the warriors of the light and truth. That is the lock from the night of the burglary. Well, Jeff Bezos bought it at an, an auction. Right. And right. We're trying to find out how much Bezos paid. <laughs> right. come, back, come back next week. I'm so grateful to be on a platform like the Washington Post. I have, I subscribe, I read, I love the Washington oh, Post. Thank you. We need films like this. So thank you very much, Stephen Lynn. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you, Michelle, big fan. Thanks for talking to us. We look forward to seeing you in 2023. Good morning and welcome. I'm Kathy Baird. I'm the Chief Communications Officer here at The Post, and it is really great to have you all with us today here in person. It has been four decades since the first cases of HIV were reported. In that time, millions of people have died from AIDS worldwide. Today, the race is on to use the scientific advances made during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic to address this ongoing health crisis. We are joined today on our stage by several individuals who have dedicated their careers to finding ways to fight, to fight HIV and its complications. First, my colleague, Francis Steed Sellers, will speak with Mark Feinberg, whose organization translates medical research into affordable global solutions. Next, Akila Johnson will talk to Clover Barnes from the DC Health Department and Cecilia Chung from the Transgender Law Center about the impact of social inequality when dealing with HIV. Then Jonathan Capehart will interview Dimitri Daskalakis from the White House about coordinating national responses to health crises and his work around HIV prevention. Before we get started, I'd like to thank today's sponsor for this event, Gilead Sciences. And we wanna thank you again for coming. And after this short video, my colleague Francis Steed Sellers will take the stage. Thank you. have to be able to not only have the scientific foundation to induce protective immunity, but you need to be able to manufacture that vaccine at a sufficient scale so that you can reach the, all the people who need it, which in this case is billions and billions of people. Good morning and welcome to The Washington Post. I'm Francis Steed Sellers, a senior writer here at The Post, and I'm delighted to welcome today Mark Feinberg, who is the president and CEO of the International AIDS 
Vaccine Initiative. Mark, a very warm welcome to Washington Post Live. Thanks so much. It's great to be here with you. We're friends. delighted to have you. Um, I wanted to ask straight away about news that we heard yesterday out, out of Dusseldorf, which was of a person, a patient being cured, apparently, of HIV. How much of a breakthrough is it? What does it mean for HIV research? Well, I think it's very important to understand that people can be cured of HIV because, you know, previously um, there have been other reports of people who have now been cured. This is now five, you know, all of these right. individuals, it's important to note, were cured under extraordinary circumstances involving often stem cell transplants that were given to them for the purpose of curing their cancer rather mm. than, you know, curing them of HIV. And in the process of addressing their cancer, they were found to be able to have eliminated the reservoir of HIV, which is really a pretty intractable aspect of HIV infection, mm -hmm. unlike many other infections where an individual might get infected and they'll either you know, suffer serious consequences, potentially die, or m most often recover and then be immune to getting reinfected with that pathogen. Mm -hmm. HIV is very different because once it establishes the infection, that infection persists in that individual for mm -hmm. the duration of their life, which distinguishes HIV from most other viral infections. And brings me to a question about what it is about HIV that makes finding a vaccine so very, very difficult. We have had something like 250 trials, right? And yeah. we still have so few that have reached the efficacy. Well, side. how much time do we have? It's a long list, um, unfortunately. Um, and HIV, I think, is without question the most difficult viral infection that medical science has taken on with the goal of developing a vaccine. You know, one is the issue of causing a persistent lifelong infection that the mm -hmm. immune system can't clear. Um, HIV has multiple mechanisms to evade and avoid the host immune response. Um, its structure of its surface proteins, you know, for instance, many people have heard of the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus spike. The equivalent of that is called the HIV envelope glycoprotein. And the differences between those are very significant where the coronavirus spike is a relatively easy target for the immune response to go after and, and defeat, whereas HIV's envelope glycoprotein is very difficult. Its structure is such that the key elements that the immune system can target are hidden inside. There's tremendous genetic diversity of HIV. You know, people, you know, pay a lot of attention, understandably, to variants of SARS-CoV-2, like Omicron, and think that genetic diversity of that virus is significant. The genetic diversity of HIV is much more pronounced. And it's because it's a persistent infection in someone, the virus is diversifying every day in that individual. So whenever that person mounts an effective immune response, the virus can readily escape from it. Wow, so we're in a constant battle against it. It is a constant battle where the immune system is chasing after the virus and the virus is always one step ahead. But because it's so difficult for the immune system to actually get access to the vulnerable domains on the surface of the HIV virus particle, it, that's why it's been so difficult to develop a vaccine against it. And just last month, I think we had an example of VaxGen, right, had a setback, got quite far in clinical trials and then did not move ahead. How well, much well, of a setback is that? Well, there have been multiple um, HIV vaccines that have progressed to efficacy mm -hmm. trials. Um, many of them were based on um, sort of older concepts, even if they apply somewhat newer technology. But the fundamental issue is when the, for most virus, for many viruses, the protective immune response is called neutralizing antibodies. And that basically means that the immune system makes antibodies that are able to block the virus from infecting a host cell. Mm -hmm. That's how the COVID vaccines work. Um, but for HIV, all of those studies that have been done to date, none of them have been able to induce neutralizing antibodies by vaccination. There is tremendous effort and actually really dramatic progress being made to find ways to develop vaccines that do elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies. And my colleagues and our partners are, are actively involved. Tell in, me a little bit more work. about that. I'm just really interested in what the most promising moments were, you know, what the most promising signs are that we're making. Well, I think the most promising science is having an idea 
and, and supportive data that we believe it will be possible with specific kinds of vaccines to induce not only antibodies that are able to neutralize HIV, but the challenge with HIV, because it's so genetically diverse, you need to be able to neutralize all or the vast majority of viral variants that are circulating. I mean, we see the impact of the different variants of concern for COVID, but it, it, again, it's much more pronounced for HIV. But there's been tremendous insights learned from a number of different studies. One, um, you know, trying to ask, do any individuals who are infected with HIV make broadly neutralizing antibodies? Mm -hmm. And significant studies that we and our collaborators and others have been involved in identified that a subset, probably just a few percent of people infected with HIV, do make broadly neutralizing antibodies. And those antibodies have more recently been shown to be able, if you infuse it into an uninfected person at high risk of HIV infection, you can protect them from getting infected with HIV, which is actually a very fundamentally important result that came out of a study the National Institutes of Health did called the AMP trial. Um, that demonstrated that if we can induce broadly neutralizing antibodies by vaccination, that would hopefully be an efficacious vaccine, but none of the candidates that have been tested in efficacy trials to date do that. But recently, a sizable group of collaborators, a really wonderful collaboration that IAVI was you know, centrally involved in, demonstrated that if you understand how broadly neutralizing antibodies evolve in the subset of individuals who make them, and then you try to recapitulate in a targeted series of way, exploiting really tremendous scientific insights at the level of structural and computational biology, so you can encourage the immune system to make a directed response to go down the path of making broadly neutralizing antibodies. And the first study of that type, the results were recently published in, in the journal Science, and it worked incredibly well. I mean, it's just the first step of this process, but showing that that is possible to get the process started is fundamentally important. And we're now actively involved in studies, including using mRNA as a way of accelerating Which that process to, ask you more about. Um, to see if we can take the immune system in an individual who's uninfected and mm. vaccinated to not just take the first step um, down the path, but go all the way down the path to make potent, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we know because HIV is so genetically diverse, we're, we need to have broadly neutralizing antibodies targeting different domains on the envelope glycoprotein. So I want to take you a step back from the science for a little bit to ask about IAVI's involvement in other diseases, because your work is primarily HIV, right? But you're also engaged with tuberculosis, Marburg, yeah. other diseases. And explain a little bit about how translational the research you're talking about for HIV is for... Sure. Um, well, you know, IAVI was founded in 1996, you know, which predates the availability of effective antiretroviral therapy, and the mm -hmm. vision was you know, an HIV vaccine will be necessary to end the AIDS pandemic, which is as true today as it was. Well, follow up on that, because we have these treatments that are really changing the, the profile of yeah. HIV, sorry, yeah. HIV across the world. Yes. So does the vaccine remain as high a priority as it was in 1994? Yes, it does. Yeah. And it does for a number of reasons. One, yeah, I mean, the availability of antiretroviral therapy is an amazing accomplishment, having you know, cared for people with HIV during the very dark days of the pandemic before effective therapy was available. It was a transformative moment when you could demonstrate that you could suppress the virus and people's immune system would you know, be largely restored, and that, that say, has saved you know, millions of lives. I mean, as you know, it's the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR, and they estimate mm -hmm. that 25 million lives have been saved by that mm -hmm. program, which is an amazing accomplishment. But as I mentioned earlier, HIV is a lifelong infection. So that means people, it's not like you take a brief course of treatment and you're, you don't need to take it. Right. You need to take it for the rest of your life. And there are now estimated to be almost 40 million people who were infected with HIV. And in 2021, it was estimated that a million and a half people became newly infected. So even if we're able to reach all of the people who need treatment, which we haven't yet reached, a significant progress has been made. But you're, like, your mortgage is growing. It's not shrinking. And you know, 
So we have almost 40 million. We're adding one and a half million each year right. or potentially more you know, going forward. It, it is so important that everyone who's HIV infected know their status and they get access to treatment and they get access to the you know, best available drugs so that they can be successfully treated. We need programs in place to ensure that they um, have those drugs for life, which we, you know, that I think is a concern because the investments in PEPFAR are, you know, the results of political decisions and ah, it's absolutely. hard to predict how those are going to go. I mean, it's been preserved for 20 years. Hopefully it will be preserved for the long term. But to think about having a program like that go on forever, there's a lot of progress being made. It's been, it been shown that People who are on effective therapy and have their viral load suppressed are not able to efficiently transmit the virus to others. So that means the treatment actually has prevention benefits, which was right. a huge insight. Um, Pre-exposure prophylaxis, which initially was a single pill of two antiretroviral drugs once a day, was shown to be highly protective against HIV. But the challenge there was that many people couldn't find it convenient or accessible to take that medication. Now there's progress on making long-acting antiretroviral drugs that one might either take you know, monthly or perhaps once every six months. The same broadly neutralizing antibodies that I mentioned earlier are being explored as p potential prevention modalities. So my message is it's not that you need one intervention or the other. You, we're going to need all we're of these need interventions. Both. But at the end of the day, we're, the only way we're going to end this pandemic is with a safe and efficacious HIV vaccine. Talking of pandemics, you're talking about a four-decade four horizon that you've been working on HIV. In the COVID pandemic, we saw vaccines, effective vaccines, come become operational in two years, a yeah. remarkable achievement. Yes. Does that leave you frustrated or enormously optimistic about the potential for mRNA? And I know that's a huge question, but... Um... Well, it makes me feel tremendous gratification for all the prior work that was done to develop an HIV vaccine, mm -hmm. because if that work had not been done, it would not have been possible to develop a COVID vaccine in the short time frame that it was. Right. Um, so it's not just the underlying science and the insights into structural biology and how the immune system responds to um, you know, different you know, foreign substances called antigens, um, but it's you know, our understanding of how the human immune system works and how you can focus it to make the kind of protective immune responses you work. But beyond the science, the people who drove the COVID vaccine effort grew up in, in the, the in, in the HIV world, Tony Fauci. And to, well, Tony Fauci is a great example of that, but Tony's just one example. The whole cadre of people who worked on that, mm -hmm. the scientific insights that made it possible to move so quickly, right. um, emerged from uh, the HIV vaccine world. The clinical trial networks that were established to study HIV vaccines were the same ones that were used for the COVID vaccines. Right. It was a fortuitous coincidence that. I mean, however terrible the COVID-19 pandemic has been, it would have been far worse if it had occurred like 10 it's, years earlier. There was also, of course, a huge government push. Yes. Um, do you feel that you have the kind of government push behind HIV vaccine that you need to move ahead? What needs to happen? Well, I mean, there's been very significant investment by um, the U.S. government as well as foundations like the Bill and Melinda mm -hmm. Gates Foundation and others. Um, in HIV vaccine research. So I don't think that historically the barrier to progress has been the amount of funding. I think the barrier to progress has been just the scientific complexity of the virus and the challenges, but it's essential now because the HIV vaccine field is at a much more promising stage than it has ever been. Mm. And we are in a position now to really move much more quickly than we've ever been able to do before along a very well-defined path with a clear goal right. in mind. And we believe that we can do that. So that's going to require sufficient resources to allow the you know, HIV vaccine research community to actually prosecute that effort. And what about the business incentives here? I mean, there's this, one can be totally cynical and say, you know, it's much better from a pharmaceutical company's point of view to be able to treat, treat people for year after year after year for the rest of their life rather than provide a vaccine which makes a disease near to eradicable, if not eradicable. Yeah. And you have one example. 
Well, I mean, having worked in the private sector, I spent about 12 years working at Merck, including on an HIV vaccine program. So there's been, over the years, significant private sector investment in mm -hmm. HIV vaccine development. You know, most recently, Janssen, the pharmaceutical company, had two phase three trials, efficacy mm -hmm. trials, of an HIV vaccine, which unfortunately didn't work. Again, those didn't induce broadly neutralizing antibodies, so it wasn't too surprising to many people that those studies didn't work but it was worthwhile exploring um, the hypotheses that they were testing there. Right now, there are two major things that impede private sector entities from engaging in a significant way in the HIV vaccine search. One is that the scientific challenges are still so right. sizable. I mean, right. we're making great progress, but it's, companies tend to get involved when there's greater certainty about the path forward. And secondly, you know, the commercial attractiveness of an HIV vaccine is not clear because, you know, the people who are at greatest risk of infection are, you know, generally people living in, you know, countries where, you know, the economic circumstances are limited or, you know, low income populations in, in higher income countries. And it's not imagined that there would, this would be like a blockbuster on the magnitude of some of the other vaccines mm -hmm. that are being um, developed. So I do believe that the private sector has a very important role to play. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we obviously partner with a number of private sector entities to do the work we do. And my own hope is that we can forge new partnerships between the public sector and the private sector. So we'll be able to go after diseases where there's not a commercial incentive because many of the diseases, whether it's HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, the emerging infectious diseases like Ebola or Marburg, those are things where there's not a commercial incentive because they tend to impact the lowest income countries. But we need solutions for those problems because you know, not only are many people at risk of them, but as we've seen again and again, it doesn't take very long in our current world for an infection in some far off land to be present in the United States and all around the world. So you have alluded, and I, I think I have to make it the last question, unfortunately, to the ability of HIV to mutate, to change, the, it's great variety. And of course, we've gained a greater understanding as a, as a general public of the coronavirus's ability to do that. But we're also up against um, bacteria that are changing and our antibiotics are becoming less effective against them. What is the role, the big role of vaccines in the humankind's battle against nature going ahead? Is it, is, is it what's gonna save us? Well, I, I, yes, I do think it's what's going to save us um, because you, know, you look at the diseases that have historically impacted humanity, whether it's you know, diseases like smallpox, um, polio, measles. I mean, the solution has always been a vaccine. Um, we've seen, whether it's antimicrobial resistance, you know, the drugs ultimately fail and the commercial incentive isn't there either, but for you know, a number of bacterial diseases, we have very effective vaccines. And the, what I want people to take away from this is that the state of vaccine science now is far more powerful and sophisticated than it has ever been. And I am confident that many of these challenges that we face will be solved by vaccine development. And I think, you know, finding ways of accelerating progress in that goal and finding ways, not just scientific innovation, but partnership innovation to get different groups to work together as effectively as possible, I think is going to be the answer to these challenges. Well, Mark Feinberg, thank you so much for finishing that conversation on a note of optimism in what's really a very difficult and challenging field. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And please stay with us. My colleague, Akila Johnson, is going to be back with our next guest, so stay with us and thank you.
Good morning and welcome back. My name is Akila Johnson and I'm a health disparities reporter here at the Washington Post. My guests today are Clover L. Barnes, the Senior Deputy Director at DC Health for HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration. And next to her is Cecilia Chung, Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Evaluation at the Transgender Law Center. Thank you and welcome, welcome to you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No applause for our guests this morning. Come on, people. <laughs> Okay, I kind of want to start by repeating some stats that we just heard in the previous panel. You know, about 1.5 million people test positive for HIV every year with around 650,000 people dying of the disease annually. But the data shows that the burden is unequal and disparities exist in terms of who the pandemic, this epidemic is impacting. Patients in wealthier countries, and I would say wealthier neighborhoods here in the U.S. as well, are more likely to die from AIDS, for example. So Clover, let's start with you. Let's talk about what the data shows us in 2021 about Washington, D.C., and it's seeing an uptick in HIV cases, a trend that's expected to continue until testing and treatment return to pre-pandemic levels. Now, we saw across the board that folks were deferring and delaying routine health screenings um, during the pandemic. How is this expected to impact HIV here in the city? We expect to see more uh, new HIV cases in the coming years. We expect that people will be looking for different modalities for testing and to find out their, their status. We also know that people don't seek preventive care in the same way that they did pre-COVID-19. And so we'll have to look at different ways to bring people into healthcare settings when they're not sick and look for ways to decrease stress and to increase mental health and wellness around our triggers to get them into HIV. What do you mean when you say modalities? Um, I mean, like, for example, as part of our end in the epidemic work, we have started a wellness program where people can get uh, Reiki, they can get acupuncture, they can have support groups that have nothing to do with HIV, just about living well and, and being mentally healthy to prepare, to prepare them to be ready to engage into the healthcare system, as opposed to worrying about all the things that have come up since the pandemic. So really looking at different ways to attract people to come into um, the healthcare setting and really be engaged and, and educated about their health. Clover, what do you see as the kind of consequence of the delay? What happens when people, like you see the increase, but what's the consequence of delaying finding out? Your we status? see more HIV infections. Okay. And we see people uh, with a later stage HIV when they come in and are finally diagnosed. We also see that people are um, hesitant to tell people. There's more stigma um, and there's a lot more anxiety around it when you come in later. So we're gonna stay on the theme of stigma for just a little bit. And Cecilia, I'm wondering if you can talk to us about kind of your experiences navigating um, some of the isms and phobias that exist out there when we think of what patients contend with, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and the fears that folks carry when they access, you know, when they're trying to access care. So talk to us a little bit about your experience trying to navigate the healthcare system. So actually, I think that I got it easy compared okay. to some of my um, trans brothers and sisters, especially the black trans women, you know, in the community, um, that racism, you you know, it, it doesn't happen just in a silo and it happens with other isms, you know, attached to it. And the impact certainly, you know, uh, is being felt differently. For me, I think that um, being an Asian um, living with HIV um, in the early days, there were no treatment whatsoever. So back in the, the early 90s, what we do is, you know, we thought we have to like get our will in order. And so it's pretty basic, you know, like we don't have to think about what's going to happen 10 years down the road. And I think that um, for me today, um, especially I have private insurance and, and I got it through my employer. So I got better services than those who are relying on um, public health services, you know, in order to, um, to take care of themselves. And I just mentioned about, you know, the black trans communities, you know, like HIV is a very distinct 
kind of virus and it actually has to have like certain conditions you know like um, in order for that to to occur you know like so um, we know that it used to be um, blood transfusions but that no longer happens usually and so it is about um, and risky sex behaviors and also um, sometimes is about injection drug use mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the key to it and unfortunately society stigma really looked down on populations you know that that had these kind of um, um, challenges you know like whether it is about sex or whether it's about drug use and and so we're not seeing the kind of priorities that we need to in order for um, HIV to be really addressed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because you, you're talking about um, stigma. And so I know you work extensively with trying to end discrimination against transgender people. And so I'm wondering if you've seen progress in your work? Can you kind of give us a little bit of state of play? Has there been progress in your work in trying to end this stigma, particularly when it comes to the issue of HIV AIDS? Um, and kind of what's the impact of those living in an HIV AIDS community? Okay, so this is almost like asking, you know, how have how much have we actually advanced in terms of sexual and reproductive health? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are part of our countries that are actually moving forward and, uh, you know, doing really well. But there's also part of our countries, you know, that's actually going back Backwards. So we're seeing all the setbacks now, you know, like um, like with with sexual and reproductive health and also with um, transgender health as well. You know, there are states that just pass laws to criminalize, you know, those who support transgender youth um, for accessing transgender related services. Um, it's not even surgery. It's about, you know, just the medications to help them delay poverty so that they can make an informed decisions when they get older, um, whether they want to pursue that or not. But that is being taken away. And, um, and so it's hard to really talk about any other interventions, you know, if we don't have the basic um, human rights and dignity. So it's hard to even kind of get to the HIV AIDS conversation if, if the basic, exactly. basic needs aren't being met is what, we're, is what you're saying. Exactly. So Clover, I want to talk to you. A Kaiser Family Foundation analysis shows that DC, if we can come back to the district for a minute, um, has the most HIV cases per capita. Mm -hmm. And so that's nearly three times the national rate. And so I guess kind of the basic question some folks might want to know is like, why? What's going on there? You know, we have a lot of people living in the district with HIV. Um, our 2021 data shows that there's about 12,000 people in DC living with HIV. And with that, we have a lot of high risk populations and those populations, a lot of them don't know their status and you can easily pass the, the virus when you don't know your status. So a lot of our work has to be around making sure people know their status and that they understand that undetectable equals untransmittable and we get people virally suppressed. Um, we also find that our borders are very fluid and people live, work, and play across the borders with Maryland and Virginia. And so that also increases the disease spread that happens in the district. And so we're looking to uh, implement programs that work to help people across the borders as well know their status and become virally suppressed. So you, you mentioned programs, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about one of those programs um, that is a pilot program, and it has to do with housing for HIV patients, and one year of, is it intensive case management and training that they have to go through? Talk to us a little bit about the impact of that and kind of the significance of a program like that. So I think you mean our prep housing program, which is a novel uh, program where we have people who are uh, same gender loving men okay. or men who have sex with men, between the ages of 25 and 35, who we provide housing for, for up to 18 months. Um, we pay all of their rent. They get intensive case management, um, employment, workforce development, and then we um, make them save 30% of their income so that as they graduate from the program, they have money to move into a new place. We help them find housing for, um, safe housing for them to move. And they also are required to take prep while they're in the housing. And so we facilitate them getting to their appointments, making sure they have their prep, all the labs and 
all the other things that are associated with um, taking PrEP. We also give them a voucher for uh, rides if they need you know, help getting back and forth to work and groceries. There are laundry facilities on site and then the case manager is accessible to them 24 hours a day. I don't like to assume, my grandmother always says, you know, you know what assumptions make out of you and me. Yes. So we're, we're, <laughs> talk us through prep for anybody who may not understand what mm -hmm. prep is and what prep, how, like what do you mean by prep mm -hmm. housing? So prep is pre-exposure prophylaxis and it's where you take a medication to uh, prevent you from getting HIV. And so we've found that DC has a low uptake of people taking PrEP. Um, our end in the epidemic goal is to have 50% of the people who are eligible for PrEP on PrEP by 2030. Right now we have about 38% of the people who are eligible for PrEP uh, on PrEP. And so we have a big jump to make. We find that the women, specifically black women, and our uh, black same gender 11 men or MSM are the people who are least, um, who are behind on the PrEP, who we need to catch up. And so we are working actively to implement programs that um, enhance their ability to access PrEP and take away barriers um, that they may have in accessing PrEP. And so Cecilia, someone you know who's living openly with HIV AIDS, and I know you're talking about how back in the day you had it good. I guess I'm wondering kind of if you can comment a little bit about, about systems and programs like this and the need for them and kind of where we are today versus where we were in the 90s. Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, it's great to see the kind of evolutions in terms of the services. And, you know, what Clover mentioned um, earlier, those are the integrated services. So it actually comes out from the early days of HIV. And, you know, and we recognize that we're not just treating somebody for one condition. You know, there are other social determinants that um, drive HIV and also drive um, health disparity and poor health outcomes. So like providing housing, providing, you know, all the um, necessary livelihood for, for folks, you know, actually helps them to like have a better focus on their health. So the goal is really about re removing as many barriers as possible so that, you know, like they can achieve the optimal health outcomes. So we learned that in the last 30 years, I would say, you know, and and you know, and we have actually adopted these models in many other um, areas. You know, like that we call medical home, for instance. You know, it's coming out from um, HIV treatment in the early days. Um, yeah, so we know that you know, if um, folks don't have their transportations, they wouldn't be able to get to the appointment on time. So let's provide transportations. If um, they don't have like like food to eat, then, you know, they can't really expect to have like better health because there's no nutrition there for them. So let's provide them with food. So, so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's a com comprehensive system. And I think that um, we are showing more and more benefits um, from having these systems in place. And I hopefully, you know, like we will have more data from this new program that Clover just mentioned. And so, you know, we're talking a little about various ways of, of helping to stymie and prevent, you know, kind of the spread of the epidemic. How might a vaccine for HIV play into this? What, what role might it play in, in potentially ending the, the Well, epidemic? a vaccine would be a game changer, okay. right? You wouldn't have to go through all the things you have to go through to get prep because there are lots of steps that go into getting prep. Um, it would be amazing. I worry about the medical mistrust in the black community. And um, we saw vaccine hesitancy with um, the Mpox vaccine, with COVID, um, and then the rates of infection more severely affect the black community. So I think we need to, before, while we're working on a vaccine, I think we need to work on building more trust and building more uh, better relationships with the black community so that we can uh, work to dis some of the misbeliefs that are out there. And also so that we could get better uptake because we know that the highest rates of HIV infection right now are in the black community. And so if we can't make the biggest impact on the community that's most affected, then I don't think the vaccine will have the impact that we all hope it will. So there's some pre-work that has to be done before we actually get to the vaccine. And uh, I think that's the work that we all need to be doing right now. 
So, you know, it's interesting talking about pre-work before the vaccine and also the vaccine. So I want to I'm trying to squeeze in two questions into a short amount of time. <laughs> okay. One has to do with I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't ask, why is it right now that the black community is being so uniquely hit by this epidemic? Oh, there are lots of reasons, right? So you think about why the black community is most impoverished, why the black community is the least amount of homeowners, you know, all those things come into play into how they how black people access health care. I can look at my own family and look at our health care seeking behaviors and see um, behaviors that are dispelled or, or implemented from generations before. And so until we can break some of those generational curses till we can have more equality, more justice in the black community, we're always gonna see disparities. And I think that we have to, as a black community, educate ourselves and make sure that we are working together to pull ourselves together, but we also need everybody to fight for black people to have equal rights and equal justice. And I believe that until we can get to that point, we will see disparities. Um, it is important for us all to know that these disparities are going to continue to exist unless we actively do something. And that's each person in this room, each person watching this live, everybody has a role to play in making sure that everybody has equal access to equal health care, equal rights, equal justice, equal everything. You know, and so one of the things that we're talking about in terms of, right, like, mistrust, bringing down trust, equal access, I think has to do with clinical trials and, and you know, who was participating. And so there was the Mosaic trial was halted last month um, that tested a vaccine on 3,900 to about 4,000 cisgendered men and transgender individuals. And so I guess I'm wondering how important is it that trans community be represented in trials like this? Well, absolutely important because like nowadays, you know, we talk about biodiversity, which means that we acknowledge that different people uh, would respond to treatment differently. So we need to see more women, more trans women and even more trans men um, that we don't really talk a lot about, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, to come into the study so that we would know um, how these vaccines are going um, to impact them or you know if, if there's any other um, other conditions that we need to like look at. Mm -hmm. And so just for a closing thought here, Clover, what you know you've touched on some, right? But if you could highlight I don't know, a handful, I'm, I'm saying a handful, but if you only give me three, I'll take three. Um, kind of the most complicating factors that you're seeing with the distribution of resources here in the district. What's um, making it most complicated? One is capacity of providers um, and, and cultural competence of those providers, making sure that they can provide culturally responsive care to the people in the community so that they trust them and they want to come there. We find our trans community often is alienated with stigma as soon as they walk in the door. And the provider might be a great resource and might have great bedside manner, but the person at the front desk or the person who puts them in the room is the person who stigmatizes them and makes them go away. Um, I also think if we had more resources for prevention, we have lots of resources for care and treatment, but it's too late by then. The people already have um, HIV. And so if we had more resources for prevention, I feel like we could do more to impact communities who are highest risk for HIV. Do you have any top contributing factors nationally that you think? Yeah, I think that it's not just national, it's international as well. In order to really talk about HIV treatment and preventions, we have to give people something to live for. Like if there's no hope in their lives, you know, what's the point of living a longer life? So which, you know, like it translates to, you know, in the um, ending the epidemic um, plan strategies, um, there are like strategies on ending stigma, ending discriminations and ending HIV relate, related crim criminalizations. You know, unfortunately it's not being implemented, you know, um, uh, you know, like all, all around the country, you know, there are still a lot of like resistance and, and intolerance. So if we really want to see, you know, vaccine and treatment being rolled out effectively and people um, would access these services, we need to create that safe environment for them. Absolutely. Thank you both. I, we appreciate you so much. Um, we are just about out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. This is a great conversation. Clover, Cecilia, again, thank you so much for being with us this morning. You all are just, thanks. There we go.
<laughs> Stay with us. We have more coming in just a few minutes. Gilead has had a long-standing commitment to equity, particularly health equity, and has devoted significant resources to working with impacted communities around the world. The Gilead Compass Initiative is a 10-year, more than $100 million commitment to address HIV in the Southern United States. Welcome, good morning, thank you all for being here in person and for those of you online. My name is Lana Wong and I'm a founding member of the Diverse Women Speakers Bureau, moderate the panel. So today we'll be discussing how COVID-19 has impacted the HIV epidemic. You know, when the COVID crisis struck, it caused major disruptions to HIV testing, prevention and services and HIV became a hidden epidemic. Contrary to what many think here in the US, we are still in the midst of an HIV epidemic, particularly in the South. So today we're gonna to take a closer look at two reports that assess COVID's impact on HIV, GLAD's Invisible People Report and the Gilead-sponsored Milliman Report. I'm honored to share the stage with two experts here who are going to help us break down that report and share the findings with us here today. So Reka Ramesh is the Vice President of Policy from Gilead Sciences. Since 2005, she's been dedicated to generating, translating, and amplifying scientific evidence for policymakers to support patient access to innovative medicines. Adedotun Ogunbaju is a behavioral scientist whose research explores the intersection between HIV, psychosocial health, and stigma among sexual and racial minority communities. He has, a, he has a PhD in behavioral health from Brown University and a master's in public health from Yale. So let's dive in. Ade, you are the author of the GLAD Invisible People Report. Why was this report needed in the first place? Thank you so much and good morning everyone. Um, this report was needed for three reasons. Uh, the first was we really wanted to understand comprehensively what was going on um, and the intersections between COVID and HIV. So we know that um, communities that were being impacted by HIV were also being impacted by COVID, but we really wanted to take a evidence-based approach to really understanding um, how these two epidemics were intersecting. The second was we really wanted to hear at a first hand how these issues were uh, affecting folks. So we interviewed people who were at risk for HIV. We also interviewed folks who were living with HIV, as well as community-based organizations who were at the forefront of the response to COVID as well as HIV. And thirdly, we really wanted to um, have this report serve as a call to action um, for the HIV response um, as well as um, for COVID, because as we understand, we've lost a lot of ground um, in our response to the HIV epidemic, and we really hope that the report will help us understand what's going on, as well as serve as a call to action to really center us in how we move forward. Great, and we'll be hearing more about that call to action later, but Reka, let me turn to you. Tell us more about the Milliman Report and why that was essential. Oh, thank you so much, and thanks, Ade. Um, similar to what Ade mentioned, you know, from the beginning of the pandemic, we were observing that, like many of us in the room, that healthcare services and the healthcare system were really being disrupted. Um, and we were hearing reports more specifically from the field, right, HIV providers, HIV, um, you know, those who could benefit from prevention, and we heard all about PrEP in the past few panels, um, and, and we were hearing just about the disruption in these services, um, and we were deeply concerned about that impact in terms of our patients and people who could benefit from PrEP. We also, as Ade mentioned, started seeing that the communities deeply impacted by COVID were also many of the similar communities impacted by HIV, and that 
that the same communities that bore a disproportionate burden of HIV. And just to give a few examples, concrete examples, you know, black Americans are disproportionately impacted by both HIV and COVID. They represent 14% of the US population, 40% of people living with HIV, and 42% of new diagnoses each year. Um, similarly, black Americans also had rates of COVID that were 2.6 times higher than white Americans, and rates of hospitalizations that were 4.7 4 times higher. There's a real risk here, right? As Ade mentioned, and other panelists prior to this, that you know, we are making worse a lot of the HIV disparities and that that gap will widen as the COVID pandemic um, has, has occurred. And as things return back to normal or, you know, in a, in a post-COVID environment, we're worried that these communities are marginalized um, and that vulnerable people are left behind unless there is action and resource committed to these areas and their recovery. So this brings me back to your, your core question on why we commissioned this report. We believe in evidence-based policymaking, and we wanted to make sure that the impact of COVID on HIV was really well understood by policymakers so that many of us who are working to end the HIV epidemic could make the case for additional support to the area's greatest in need. That's great, and, and that's part of why we're having this conversation today. So yes, we're definitely needing to make that case. Those are incredibly sobering statistics. Um, Ade, the, the GLAD report really focuses on the invisible people and the human voices and personal stories behind those have been in, uh, impacted by the HIV uh, epidemic that has been exacerbated so much by COVID. So can you share one of the most powerful stories that came through to you in, in preparing this report? Yeah, um, we, we, like I said, we spoke to a lot of folks uh, throughout the country. We really focused on areas where people were most impacted by HIV um, and interviewed uh, people in different community-based organizations, people living with HIV, people who had been newly diagnosed with HIV during the pandemic. That was a big focus area. And what we really found was um, outside of just um, barriers to accessing medication and barriers to being able to seek, uh, get care in the hospital settings. There were other issues that folks were talking about, mental health issues, um, not being able to gather. So there was someone we talked to, um, a 37-year-old um, black gay man in the Southern United States who said um, he had just been newly diagnosed with HIV and right before the pandemic hit and was um, connected with a support group um, that was meeting in person. But as a result of the pandemic, that had to be moved to a virtual space. And for him, it was working at first, but it was just different. Um, and he actually ended up sort of having to kind of stop and, um, and, and not really engage in that way. And that really impacted him dealing with this new diagnosis. So that's just one example of, uh, of how the pandemic has really affected folks. Great, thank you. Reka, what is one of the most striking findings or pieces of data that came out of the Milliman report? Yeah, thank you. I mean, the Milliman report really showed that even at the end of 2021, there were many parts of the country that had experienced HIV testing rates, treatment and PrEP utilization rates that remained far, far below pandemic levels. For example, test, HIV testing had declined sharply across the US um, at the beginning of the pandemic, at a time where COVID cases were, were greatly increasing and access to care, as Adi mentioned, was limited. There was also a great variation across states, with many states in 2021 experiencing rates more than 20% lower than 2019 rates of screening. The analysis also looked at the number of new HIV diagnosis, diagnoses and the number of new um, newly diagnosed individuals starting on HIV treatment. Even in late 2021, the rates for both were far below 2019. And from a regional perspective, the South stood out as being really further behind, um, with 17 states really kind of having the, the worst levels. Um, these rates are very concerning because these prolonged reductions 
in HIV testing and treatment can not only have a detrimental impact on patient outcomes, but also on the risk, the increased risk of HIV transmission. So if we are going to try to achieve the ambitious goals that the federal government has set out um, to end the HIV epidemic by 2030, we, brought, we again must really pay attention collectively to the funding and resources that would ramp up HIV testing, treatment, access to prevention services in the communities that are hardest hit. Great, thank you. So, so let's talk about action. How do, how do we get there? Um, what are some of the concrete actions that come out of these reports to address those disparities and inequities in HIV services? Ade, let's hear from you first. I would say, um, first, we need to make sure there's representation. So representation in places where decisions and policies are made um, in a way that folks who are making those decisions reflect the communities that are most affected. Um, second, I would say making sure that we invest locally, so all solutions are inherently local, so making sure that folks who are at the forefront of um, really responding to the epidemic, both COVID and HIV, as we've been talking about today, are really being invested in and um, be, really being up, 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 upheld. Um, to be able to continue to do this work. And lastly, and most importantly, I would say just prioritizing um, our, ability to, uh, our ability to undo these structures that really do are beyond HIV and COVID, but that make certain communities more likely to be most affected by those things. So these is racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, just systems that are in place that sort of keep folks marginalized and impoverished. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. Reka, what would be your call to action from, from the report? Yeah, you know, there's so much we could all do together, so um, it's hard to know where to start. Um, if we do believe strongly, though, and we do at Gilead, that in order to end the epidemic for everyone everywhere, we do really have to focus on these health disparities and equities that these, you know, communities are facing. Um, and this is right, what came out of the Milliman report as well as um, uh, at the GLAD report and, and a lot of the work that my colleagues and I are trying to do. Um, I'll hit three areas really where we've, we have you know, started kind of really working through disparities and inequities. Um, one, you know, obviously, is the science. You know, for the past 30 years, Gilead has been transforming um, prevention, treatment, cure for, for diseases that affect disproportionate, um, disproportionately affect minority communities and, and our work in HIV is not done. And so we continue and are committed to that scientific advancement even in HIV. Beyond the science, you know, we're really working with new partners and, and partnerships um, with governments, academia, community organizations, GLAD, um, historically, you know, black colleges and universities, um, you know, to really develop the advocacy, the, um, the, the kind of grassroots education um, that needs to happen in order for the urgency to be understood. And um, some examples of that include, you know, federal, you know, partnerships with, with many, you know, policy advocacy groups to really talk about ending the HIV epidemic, for example, with the federal government or state and local governments, what policies can be put in place to really make a difference both locally and federally? Um, how do social determinants of health affect specifically the black community that's experiencing HIV? Um, we've also worked with programs, you know, with, with organizations across the country, community health centers, local health departments, um, emergency departments, to develop and disseminate best practices in screening and linkage to care for HIV. Um, and, and hopefully that is so that everybody has an opportunity to experience you know, good health care as it relates to their HIV um, diagnosis and prevention. And then just another example I'll highlight is a longstanding 
partnership that we've had with Emory University to really map and disseminate HIV data nationally through AIDSview.org. And this was really a project that was developed over a decade ago and continues to be one of the fundamental um, foundations of raising awareness for people and places that are bearing a disproportionate uh, burden of HIV in this country. And then a few examples, we also do a lot of giving through our foundation and, and other corporate giving programs. Um, and we support organizations that really are trying to reach the very people we're talking about today. Um, an example, you all saw a video just now on the Compass Initiative, right, which is a $100 million, 10-year commitment to support HIV, kind of combating HIV in the southern US. Um, we've also done things like, you know, support the federal government's Ready, Set, Prep initiative um, to end the HIV epidemic by committing um, up to 2.4 million bottles of medication annually to the CDC um, for, for that program. And we have been really honored to be recognized as a top funder for HIV um, AIDS programs worldwide since 2016, and actually just last year surpassed the Gates Foundation in that, um, in that, in that ranking. So I, I guess in closing, I would just want to reiterate you know, what everyone else has said today, right? Our commitment to continuing to work with communities that are most impacted by HIV, um, to champion innovations, partnerships, and programs, you know, that's a collective call to action. Um, and we, we really will all need to participate to, in the HIV epidemic globally and here in the US. Thank you so much. I couldn't have wrapped it up uh, better with that call to action. So thank you both, Rekha Ade, for the important work you're doing for this important conversation. And for those of you in the audience and online, if you want to add your voice to the conversation, please do using the hashtag post live. So thank you so much. I'm Lana Wong. We're going to now hand it over back to our colleagues at the Washington Post. Thank you. It shouldn't matter where you live in the country or how much money you make or how you respond or how we, we have to respond across the board to HIV epidemic everywhere and support all people living with HIV. Thank you, HIV, for the technology and the infrastructure to lead to a COVID vaccine. So many of the people who you may be familiar with who are researchers that have done work in HIV treatment and prevention and vaccines are the exact people who did research in COVID vaccines. And so uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, HIV, for the infrastructure. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Capehart, Associate Editor at the Washington Post. We continue our conversation on the quest for an HIV vaccine with Deputy Coordinator for the White House National Monkeypox Response, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis. Dr. Daskalakis, <laughs> see, I told you back there I would mess up your last name. It's okay, you can call me Dimitri, All right. everyone else okay. does. Good, great. Perfect. Dimitri, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you. So uh, you are on loan from the CDC, <laughs> where you are the Director of the Division of HIV Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we will talk about HIV specifically in a moment. But there's a story in, in the New York Times today that brings the two. Uh, monkeypox, uh, for those who are not initiated, is now Mpox. The, the link between Mpox and HIV, um, that people who have Mpox 
should also be tested for HIV. Talk about the significance of this story. Sure, so the significance really is one about interacting epidemics that are made worse by social determinants of health. We've heard a lot about that today. That's called a syndemic. And so MPOX does not live in isolation. It interacts with other infections as well as sort of social circumstances that makes those infections worse and uh, impacts communities. So, um, you know, I'll say back in September, uh, of last year, there was a publication from CDC that showed that 41% of people who were diagnosed with MPOX were also living with HIV. Um, in October, um, another publication came out from CDC and MMWR that really focused on the 57 um, severe cases that they heard about hospitalized individuals. And at that time, what they found was that over 80% of them were living with HIV, only 10% of them were taking antiretroviral medications, and many, many of them, the vast majority, had had T cells of less than 50, mm -hmm. which I haven't seen in a cohort that large since I did medicine in the 90s. And so definitely um, recent data that's emerged from uh, Chloe Orkin, who's a fabulous uh, uh, clinician um, from the UK, really affirms the fact that uh, MPOX does not live in isolation and more severe disease can occur in people living with HIV, which is why <clears throat> um, when you think MPOX, you need to think um, HIV testing as well. In fact, when you think HIV testing, you should think MPOX vaccine because they're interacting epidemics and it's an opportunity to do uh, prevention um, beyond just one infection, but rather in that syndemic, that interacting epidemic model that really um, addresses what people need in their daily lives and um, their health seeking behavior. So um, it's definitely a very important finding and one that I think, um, you know, as early as September uh, of last year, CDC actually included uh, monkeypox or mpox on the list of opportunistic infections. So it's already there. And I think that this study just affirms the fact mm -hmm. that um, we need to sort of be holistic in our, our prevention approach, including HIV and MPOX. So then where are we today in terms of controlling the spread of MPOX? Do we have it under, under control, if, if that's the right word? Yeah, I want zero, so we're not at zero yet. So we have two about two cases um, per day reported in the United States. And that's down from? Over 400. So um, there have been over 30,000 cases in the United States, and so definitely um, in infections are slowing down, but they continue uh, to occur. Um, we see uh, fewer and fewer counties um, are reporting new MPOX cases, which is great news, but this is really not the time for us to back off. It's time to actually push the accelerator down faster on vaccine. We are talking today about HIV vaccine. We don't have one yet. We do have an MPOX vaccine, which we should talk about as a dress rehearsal for the HIV vaccine, because the same equity issues that we saw in MPOX vaccination are inevitable in HIV vaccine unless we work, as Clover said earlier today, um, to actually address um, sort of trust and prevention services for people um, with a clear awareness on equity. So we're definitely making progress um, and we need to hustle on vaccine um, for MPOX because um, <clears throat> spring and summer are coming and that tends to be when people have more interactions that could lead to MPOX exposure. So really working to create that immune force field that we need with vaccine needs to happen now. So then what are you learning from the MPOX response that might impact the, the, the response to HIV in other infectious diseases. I know you just said this is the dress rehearsal in terms of a vaccine for, for HIV in, term, in terms of equity, but talk about science, scientifically. Are you learning things dealing with MPOX that are instructive for coming up with an HIV vaccine? Sure, well, I'll, I'll start by talking about um, what we've learned from the behavioral science. I think that that's really important. So the first is that if you provide people information in a way that they understand, they actually take you up on what you've told them to do. So I, I think that MPOX is an example where we've been very clear in messaging, talking about sex talking about sexual health. And the result is that populations actually change their behaviors for a while as we ramped up vaccination. 
Um, so that I think is probably one of the most instructive lessons, mm -hmm. not only for how we should message better in HIV prevention, but also in how we're going to need to uh, message when we have an effective HIV vaccine. Um, I think vaccines on the shelf don't really prevent diseases. They have to go into people's arms. But before they go into people's arms, you have to get into people's heads and hearts. And I think that we really have a lot of work to do to make sure that um, we sort of set the runway um, appropriately so we can land an HIV prevention plane with the vaccine when we have it. Because right now, that um, runway is full of obstacles and most of them are equity related. Um, in terms of just general science, I think that the study that you talked about is, I think, show, is very instructive, which is that none of these infections live in isolation. HIV does not live in isolation. It interacts with viral hepatitis. <clears throat> it interacts with uh, challenges to people's mental health. It interacts with substance use. It interacts with um, social determinants like housing, racism, sexism, homophobia, all of those things. And so I feel like one of the more instructive moments in the science of MPOX is that the way that you intervene on interacting epidemics or syndemics is with a similarly fashioned syndemic approach. If you just focus on one thing, if you just focus on HIV, you're not gonna win the battle because it's about the sexism, it's about the homophobia, it's about the transphobia, it's about the racism. And if you address those factors, um, even imperfectly, you're going to have a better outcome in disease prevention. So then the, the word that comes to mind, and I, and I wrote it down and circled it so I wouldn't forget, is stigma. Yeah. I mean, you, one of the reasons or part of the reason that we can't have open conversations about sex, open conversations about behaviors that lead to increased infection is because of stigma. How do we deal with that? Not just the stigma that um, people feel, yeah. um, the person with the virus feels, but also the stigma of society at large. How do you change those two things at the same time? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important things that we did recently at CDC, which I think is emblematic of, of, of how to respond to this, is to really realize that, um, that risk is something that is, uh, is not real. That risk is something that we create, saying somebody is high risk. Mm -hmm. Some behavior is high risk actually creates like a level of stigma that prevents people from seeking services. And so really thinking about, you know, there are, there are um, not people who are high risk, but situations that are potentially high risk that we can, potent that we can address. There are risk factors, but really sort of, the, one of my favorite doctors said to me that, um, that when you talk to someone about their high risk behavior on Friday, you don't realize that for them, that was a good Friday night. And so, it, right? So if, if you start the dialogue by saying like, you are a high risk person, who's gonna walk through that door? Do you wanna walk through a door that says you're a high risk person? I certainly don't. And so really um, shifting the narrative into sexual health, shifting the negative, the, the narrative into a strategy that is what we call at CDC status neutral, which says like, it doesn't matter what your status is. We just need to identify services and, and interventions that work for you, as opposed to sort of create like this impossibility of you have a flashing HIV sign that you have to walk in under and that that it's going to somehow be comfortable for people who may not be comfortable with sort of identifying themselves as people as at risk. Okay, yeah. so I want to go back to your Friday night yeah, uh, analogy go. because it, the, the, uh, everyone <laughs> reacted to that, um, and I think with good reason. For a lot of people, that Friday night was a fun time. Totally. So how? So then, how do you talk to that person? Yeah. How do you get them to come through the door and see? What's the language? Is what I'm getting. Yeah. At. I mean, I, I think first is, um, and I think we heard before, like every piece of the service interaction needs to be about um, affirming people's lives. As we sit here, and um, there are attacks happening on LGBTQ people that is bad HIV prevention, right? So things that, that prevent transgender health, um, things that prevent health for LGBTQ people, things that prevent health for women of color, including sort of deeper issues around reproductive health, all of those things are going to increase HIV rates. So the very important thing is that the service environment needs to be conducive to people walking in the door. So it's not how we want to deliver service, it's how people want those services delivered that needs to be the focus. And you so, weren't done. Keep no, going. <laughs> I, I, yeah. So, so we have to sort of we have to sort of step back 
and listen to the community and listen to the folks that we serve and not say we're going to build this and they come, but rather say, how can we make what we build more amenable to people coming to us and how can we reach them where they are? And so I feel like a lot of the stigma conversation has to do with the fact um, that, that there are institutional factors that maintain systems of stigma within HIV that need to be disrupted. And reality is it's work to disrupt them, blending funding, sort of CDC funding and HRSA funding in a way to create um, a door that everyone can walk through and get the services they need, and also that every door leads to the services they need as well, is a really important strategy. And so um, really looking at the way that we um, deliver care and deliver service, we need to be critical and we need to say, just because it's worked for the 86% of people who know their HIV status, the 65% of people who are virally suppressed in the US, how do we get to the 15, 16% that don't know their status who aren't going to come to sort of the care services we've provided? And how can we get to the people who are living with HIV who aren't on antiretroviral medicines to get them on medicines so it's good for their own health and also prevents transmission, U equals U, which we heard about before. And it really um, requires folks to step back there's work to be done to blend funding like DC has done as an example is work. And Clover could talk to you about that more if she were on stage, <laughs> but it's, it's work, but that work has benefits. You see benefits in viral suppression. You see benefits in, in quality of life that, pe that people sort of encounter when they come into services. So um, you know, I think that um, there's lots of ways to think about disrupting stigma. I'm gonna say one more thing before the next thing is really important. Like, so we often look at public health as a way to solve the issue of stigma and inequity. Social justice, which is an all of society intervention, is really the way. Public health can address symptomatic pieces of inequity that touch health, but unless we look at housing, racism, sexism, transphobia, um, we're not going to get there because public health only is a band-aid on top of those issues because that's what drives infection and what really leads us to poor outcomes in HIV. So then the next question I just wrote down, because this all makes sense, but then how much of an impediment are the people in this town at either end of Pennsylvania Avenue, particularly the one down there with the dome? Um, I so, hmm, trying to think about buildings with domes. So the, <laughs> the, uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to teach people. And I think that, um, that there are challenges, I think that definitely sort of looking at um, how we can express better um, the importance of, of uh, HIV related public health to folks, I think is critical. And I think that people in this room, um, folks that work in community-based organizations, advocates, their voices are really important to make it clear that this isn't about red state, blue state. This is about people's health. And we know that we have interventions that work. We need a vaccine. I know that's why we're here. A vaccine would be amazing. But we also have interventions that can really control the HIV epidemic. And if we focus on people's health and provide them the services that they need, people's viral loads become undetectable. People go on pre-exposure prophylaxis, which you've heard about before, or PrEP. Yeah. And what happens is you shut down HIV transmission. I need to say one important thing, which is that there is a dose response um, with HIV um, outcomes with funding. So I think, um, Having worked in New York um, and sort of seeing an influx of funding for HIV prevention around the local ending the HIV epidemic initiative, with that influx of funding, you can look at the epidemiology where cases of, of HIV and incidence of HIV decreased once that funding landed um, into um, really service providers. Same for the United States. I think we have um, in the president's budget, great opportunities. There was an opportunity for a, pre -ex a national pre-exposure prophylaxis program um, that didn't get, uh, get sort of realized in Congress. Um, there is ending the HIV epidemic, which is not fully realized in terms of its funding. So I think that um, you know, public health resources are critical for public health success. And so really looking at ways that we can you know, get the attention of folks in, building, uh, in certain buildings with domes uh, to remind them <laughs> that, um, that HIV prevention is critical uh, and it's safe saves hundreds of millions of dollars. Lifetime cost of someone living with HIV is $500,000. Mm. If you prevent that infection, 
you save five hundred thousand dollars. And so it is either it's very often cost effective, at least if not cost savings, to do the work to prevent HIV. And that's really what's behind all of the work. It's about about really making sure that people's health is good. But actually, it is cost effective. It is a financial intervention. So if folks can hear that, um, an investment in HIV goes a long way. That's an interesting. That's a good message. I can imagine that it will land on certain ears in that building with the dome uh, quite well. Uh, in the three minutes that we have left, I want to try to get through a, a bunch of things. Uh, how close are we to achieving the global goal to end HIV AIDS by 2030? Reference prior statement. So if appropriately resourced, we have the technology to be able to get us to a place of really good HIV control. We need an HIV vaccine. Right. So period, like no matter what. So I think that, um, you know, at this point, I think it is um, aspirational for us to achieve the goals by 2030 for a couple of reasons. One, not adequately resourced, which we talked about. And two, COVID. I think we will have sort of aftershocks of COVID for a while. Like HIV diagnosis rate will increase because folks have uh, not been diagnosed because of some care interruptions that happened during COVID. Mm -hmm. Not diagnosing people with HIV during COVID also means that they weren't aware of their status and may not have gone on antiretroviral medications so they could potentially um, uh, pass the infection forward. So I think, I think that we're gonna have a, it's a tall order to mm -hmm. achieve the goal by 2030. We're all trying our best to get there, but resources are needed. Um, then how close are we to an HIV vaccine scientifically? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that we're, I, 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 so much of what we know about immunology has come from HIV. And so it's exciting to see that sort of what HIV has provided to the world is now coming back to HIV, sort of the COVID experience, the mRNA experience. We've heard from colleagues from Yavi about this as well. You know, I think that there are scientific challenges. HIV is um, a tricky virus. Um, there's different kinds of immune responses that are needed to control it. So I think that, you know, the vaccine machine is in the right place to um, sort of move forward. And I think it's a, a space to watch. Um, I wish I had a crystal ball and could tell you how soon we would have one, but I think that advances in immunology are, are getting rapid again. So I think that we have a really good shot. We are not there yet, but I think that, um, that the energy is, is in the right place to move this forward. Uh, and in the minute that we have left, uh -oh. in your view, which cities are taking the best approach uh, to ending HIV uh, AIDS or coming up with the most innovative ways to support people living with HIV? Not just because I'm sitting in DC, <laughs> but I really think that um, I, I, I love all of our grantees. So I'll start by that and saying like every city has really, really great strategies. But some of the cities um, that have sort of shifted their portfolio into this, this status neutral space where it's service delivery um, based on what people need as opposed to simply their HIV status, DC, New York City, Chicago, San Francisco, like the places that are really epicenters for HIV have really um, been great examples. But I think that there are also some fantastic rural examples like Kentucky mm -hmm. that's done really innovative telemedicine um, and all of these other strategies to end HIV that's appropriate for their context. So I've listed some of the ones that are sort of highlights for me, but I'll say that um, we've seen so much great work across the country um, that we need to keep those lessons and learn them not only for what we do here, but also what we do internationally, because I'll also say international examples out there are important to us, like PEPFAR. I think we're getting sort of bi-directional inspiration um, from each other. Like some of our ideas are moving into the international space and some of the great PEPFAR ideas we're pulling into what we're doing every day in the US. Okay, since we're already out of time, keep it, well, it PEPFAR uh, and the lessons of PEPFAR um, in the United yes. States. Give, give a, an example. Yeah, I, I think that from the PEPFAR perspective, um, their amazing ability to understand um, what their countries are doing from the perspective of data and using that data in real time to address um, changes in their programming is perhaps my number one most inspirational thing that I hear from them. Um, I think for us, like I think our status neutral service delivery model, our syndemic focus, which includes both in communicable and non-communicable diseases, is something that they're very inspired by. So, um, you know, such great conversations. I think MPOX helped that as well, but so many great interactions and conversations conversations about how we can inspire more excellence, um, both internationally and domestically is really exciting. All right, one, one more question. Okay. Are you going back to the CDC? 
I, I, my intention is to go back to the CDC. I think that we're just um, sort of dealing with what transition looks like, but uh, you know, I, I, that's the goal. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, Deputy Coordinator for the White House National MPOX Response. Thank you. Thank you. Very much for joining us. And thanks to all of you who are here in person and online for watching the quest for an HIV vaccine on Washington Post Live. To learn more about our upcoming programs, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thank you all very much for being here. Thank you.